everybody, Scout Crafty here again. It's Wednesday, midweek Wednesday. Happy hump day. Hope everything is going so far. Also, the middle of March. So uh, this month is going flying by. I mean, it's the middle of March. I remember just last week we were saying it was the beginning of March. Just flying by. Anyway, a uh, couple things to talk about today. You know, I, you know I'm on a media blackout, right? Which means I don't watch any news. Anything that has to do with news, I don't want to hear it. I'm, I'm in my bunker, and that's where I'm going to stay for the next few years, and I don't want to hear about anything. So what happens is um, I was watching some old programs, and I said, you know, it's funny because, and I know some of you older guys will relate to this, um, the newer generation really doesn't have the same worries as we did back then growing up, you know? I remember growing up, uh, the, uh, we had a whole different set of worries. For example, uh, one worry was uh, a tiger pit. You know, we would watch we would watch our shows, you know, our heroes back then. You know, Buster Crab and Chuck Connors, all these guys, these, you know, and, and we'd say, wow. You know, they would always fall into these same problems, you know, like a, like a tiger pit or remember uh, human leg snares, you know? We don't, you know, that's something we really never ran into. But it, as a kid, it's like every every episode, these guys were falling into nets. Remember nets? You know, you'd be walking around, along and all of a sudden a net would fall on top of you. And usually it was followed by being pointed at with spears. These things never happened to me. I, and I don't know if it's, uh, you know, punji sticks. I was, you know, when I was a kid, I was always afraid of punch, stepping on a punji stick. I never seen one. Maybe some of you guys in Nam, you know, that's a whole different thing. But, uh, you know, I mean, all these things we had to worry about back then. How about quicksand, right? Didn't we have one? <laughs> quicksand, I thought it would be a much bigger problem when I got older than it actually turned into. Never had a problem with, <laughs> with quicksand. quicksand. Rattlesnakes? I don't know. Maybe you guys out west, you know. But, I mean, uh, I remember <laughs> growing up thinking all my uh, childhood heroes... They were always, you know, shooting the heads off of rattlesnakes that were, you know, ready to strike at them and all these things. Never had to worry about it. Maybe because I live in New York City, you know, that might be one of the reasons I don't run into a lot of this. But, you know, there are, you know, other things that I thought I would run into. And I said one, at least one time in my life, maybe I will be uh, shirtless, strapped between two poles and being whipped. That was another thing, you know. I said, all oh, my childhood heroes, they were always whipped at the stake. I don't know. Never happened, never, never even came close to that. So I think that uh, the kids today, they don't have to worry about the same things. But I know growing up, I was thinking, man, all these the leg snares. I was always looking for that loop of cord in the, you know, on a trail in the woods, thinking the next thing I'm going to be hanging upside down with the blood rushing to your head. You know, when you hang upside down, the blood rushes to your head. It's like uncomfortable, right? Anyway couple things to talk about today. Uh, a good friend of the show, Gene from New Jersey, wrote in and was trying to replicate one of the wrenches I did with the holes in it. And he says the holes came out crooked. And he was wondering why. I said, man, I tried. I was so careful. I think I know what the problem was. I think I know what the problem was. Uh, and I, I think it had to do with the punch. I asked for a picture and he showed me. And let, let me go through some of the punch real quick. And we'll see if we can correct that problem. Now, one day, sooner or later, you are going to be tasked with the, um, where you're going to have to make a accurate hole. It could be a series of holes or something, but you're going to have to drill an accurate hole. Now, um, when you're drilling a series of holes like this, it's really important to realize that um, you're lucky on this particular uh, molding, for example, because you could put a fence up against a drill press, mark some lines, and we could drill this down and move it down and do it that way and drill it out. And, you know, in a case like this, that's best case scenario where you drill out these holes. And when you're finished, you'll get some accurate looking holes like this that are, you know, spaced nicely and look even and uniform. However, we're not usually that lucky a lot of times. And it might be in the middle of a project or something. And you might have to drill a series of holes. And there's nothing worse then when you have to drill a series of holes, if you are off by even a few thousands, it will stand out like a sore thumb. One of these holes, if it's off by even a little bit, will just, it will stand out as, wow, look at that third hole. It's off. It's not correct. It's not, 
spaced properly uh, properly it's off one way or the other so um we have to learn how to drill accurately and the way to drill accurately is to punch accurately and that's where it all starts now i'm demonstrating this on wood but uh you know a lot of times you'll be drilling into metal which uh, is has its own uh issues but right now i want to show you the reason that i drew i drew these pencil lines here to show you let's say we want to mark off and drill those you know make four separate holes you know, the thickness of that line itself is, uh, it can lead to a, uh, a quite a bit of variance in your holes because look how thick that line is. That's why anybody that, uh, when you're doing real accurate work, and again, in woodworking, that'll be fine because, you know, you're, you're only in woodworking a sixteenth of an inch is usually close enough, but in metalworking, you know, that's why I use a scribe. And, and with this, I used Randy Richards' beautiful scribe that he uh, sent over. And this is fantastic for, th for marking and things like that. And now you can see the difference in the thickness of that line compared to that line right there. And again, this is on wood. And it's hard to see. You see, like, you see, it's hard to see. That's why we use what's called a layout fluid or a dicum so that it shows up more and you could get a better line. But now you could see, and that's why you'll see, uh, like my buddy Ben just picked up a nice uh, Staric combination hammer magnifying glass. This is what it was used for. You see here, because when you look here, you can get the exact line. You can see where it is. And I'll show you how this is used and why this hammer is such a small, lightweight hammer. You say, you know, really, what's it, you know, you can't really set much of a punch with that. You're not supposed to, and I'll show you Okay, why. this is called layout fluid, or what we call, Dicom is the company that makes it, and they've been making it for years now. Usually you'll see it in blue, but uh, they make a special Scout Crafter Red, and you'll see what it looks like. Look at that. Look how nice that is. Scout Crafter Red. Actually, actual color. If you ask, call up Dicom and you ask them for that color, this is the color you get. It's like a candy apple scout craft or red look at that so you give that a second to dry and let me show now, you how you although dicom has been used for 50 60 years was a staple in every machine shop uh today it seems like a lot of newer uh, machinists that don't have the time they'll take a marker like this and they'll they'll rub out a, a line like this you know to get the ink on there and i'll show you how that you know and that's kind of what they do today it's not the same. It's not the same, man. It's just not the same. Okay, so I'm going to scribe some lines, just random lines, but uh, just so you could see what our next step is. Now you could see how beautifully sharp and how those lines pop out at you. You see that there? You know, especially the intersections, when you look at them close, you could see it's... Uh, you know, the Dicom does a really good job, much better than the marker does. I mean, we all use a marker in a rush, but uh, the Dicom is the way to go. Now, if, if you were using wood, your next step, you can use any one of our, you know, we use awls and punches and things like that. And, you know, you could get to the line and, and line it up here and look at it closely and then just uh, press your punch into it. Because, again, it's wood. And uh, press it down, look at it, make any adjustment you have to do, and, and then give it a tap. Okay, now there we have a perfectly centered hole on there, right? Beautiful. Now, it's not so easy when you're dealing with metal or especially a tool or something like that. So that's why uh, you have these punches. And you'll see a lot of times you'll, you'll have your favorite punches that you use. But you want a nice sharp punch for your initial Everybody punch. has their favorite punches for layout work. Whether it be if you're kind of in a rush and, you know, this is a spring punch where you can press down or punch a hole. But for doing really accurate work, you'll see most guys, they use, you know, I like a, a longer punch. But again, I like a sharp punch with a, a point I could see. So here's one of my favorite uh, layout punches here. It's just a simple punch here. And you can see it's a... Uh, it's a Baltimore 732nd, but you can use any one of these. And uh, and then let me show you what happens, how you get Now, the first thing you want is you want a good amount of light. And you got, it, this seems like it takes a long time. Most guys just knock a banger. But you really, if you want accuracy, you have to get this point of your punch directly in that intersection. Now, sometimes if you scribe, if you can scribe the line deep enough, like if you're going to be going over the work later with a, a mill or something, you can follow the line until you feel the intersection. Like we could do it here. You could feel the scrape line, move it over and you get to the intersection that way. Now you just hold it here. You stand the punch up now to double check it. That's when you use the uh, magnifying glass. And what you would do is you would take the magnifying glass like this and you would get down real low 
and look at it and make sure that it's on the punch. And uh, when you do, you give it a slight tap, a very light tap with the hammer. Now it should look something like this. Now it's a little Just, hard to pick up the camera, but I want to show you what uh, what a perfectly, now the ones on the right here are perfectly centered in those lines. Can you see that there? They're perfectly centered, one and two, up and down. The center line, we have the top one is a little bit low, and the bottom one is a little low and to the left. You can see that? Again, they're close, and good enough for government work in many times, but not, not when you really want to be accurate, because if you're drilling holes next to each other, that will stand out like a sore thumb. So what we do now, those are just light taps. Now we adjust them with a slightly bigger tap, and that's where I move. Remember, we went to the sharp tap. You could use the same one, but then I like to move to uh, a one of my, here we go, uh, a tap like this here. And then what you'll do is you'll put this in. Now we see that we have to move this hole. You could just about make out the hole. We have to move it over to the left a little bit. And I'll show now you how Very to do easily, that. we're going to try and move this hole here up a little bit, that little dimple, because it's a little too low. So we take the, we rest our punch in the hole. We tilt it to the right about uh, 15 degrees. Give it a light tap. That's going to move the dimple over and up a little bit. And you could see, as you could see, it moved it over and up a little bit. Now, we just got to give it another slight tap, just a little bit that way. Again, a light tap. Now that that hole, that dimple is perfectly centered. You can see that perfectly centered. Now, when you're happy that it's perfectly centered, you stand it straight up, and then you give it a good tap, straight down. Now you have. Remember, we just move that one. See that, and we just move that one over there. Perfect. Now you remember that we had a couple of those dimples that were off, and now each one is perfectly centered on that scratch mark that we made with the uh, the scratch all. Now you can see here. Now we're going to do that's a, just a, using a secondary punch. Now we're going to take a third punch, uh, one that here, and we're going to uh, deepen the hole a little bit with a good solid blow because now these holes are perfectly centered. A good solid blow to widen them a little bit more. Okay, now you see we uh, dimpled them out, and you can see there's quite a bit of depth to them. You can see the depth there, right there. Now you have your center drill. That's what you're going to use to first start your hole. And you can see when we put the center drill in that hole, there's no wandering. It's solid in there. It's not going to wander, and it'll start a good hole. And then we can make our holes, and they will come out picture perfect. Now that we spot drilled our holes, now all we have to do is finish drilling, but now you use the lubricant and finish drilling through them. Now when you're finished with your operation, little paper towel, little bit of acetone, acetone, and uh, that'll wipe right off. We'll wipe the dicum right off and uh, and then you're back ready. So there we have six uh, holes. You can see how nicely spaced they are. Beautiful job on here. And you can see, and that's why, Gene, I asked you if you punched your holes before you drilled them in. And uh, that's why I, I went through this long uh, explanation. I think that's your problem. You can see how nicely they're lined up. That's the key. You, you start, you know, if you're one, one thousandth of an inch off, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb because they're not even. And they have other ones to compare with. So... Hope that helps. So remember, uh, perfect practice makes perfect. Not practice makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So you have to do this every once in a while so you don't get rusty. And it's a good idea in the shop sometimes to whip out a piece of scrap material and then do it up. And I hope that helps you out, Gene, because I guarantee that was your problem. I guarantee you uh, you didn't mark it correctly and you were a little bit off. And that's why they seem so off. But uh, you won't have that problem next time. Uh, next up, we have some really cool tools to check out. Let's get right to it. Uh, I have a really great tool, but, uh, to show you, my dad, as you know, was a, uh, a truck driver for, uh, Petroleum Heat and Power Petro. It was an oil truck company here, and he used to drove that for 40 years. He drove an oil truck, and, and, uh, I remember when I was a kid, about, you know, eight or nine years old, sometimes he would take me to work, and other times he would park out front and have lunch while, uh, he was having lunch. I would go sit in the truck and play. Oh my God, it was some good memory sitting in that old Mack truck. And I remember one time I looked behind the seat and there was a wrench. 
And maybe that's what started me on this wrench kick that I have, but I looked, searched high and low for that wrench. Couldn't find the exact one until a couple weeks ago I found it and I paid big money for it, but I think you'll think it's worth it. Let's check it out. I'm gonna have some dinner now. Let's check it out when I get back. Now that tool that I fell in love with was what I thought was this tool. And my father was an expert with the four-way lug wrench. We're all familiar with those, the standard four-way lug wrench. He could take on and off a lug nut in seconds because he had his massive hands. He would spin that wrench, it would go 100 miles an hour, and he would drop it into the hubcap. You've all seen it done before. Now, he had this in his truck, and this was different. It was a speed wrench style. You could see with the swivel handles, and, I, and it had this uh, rotating uh, apparatus back here that would engage different lug nut sizes. And I said, wow. But I, when I bought this, I spent a long time looking for this. This one is made by Blackhawk. You can see here it's a black walk and a black hawk and it has a patent date of 1923. Although um, on the two handles it has a patent date of 1920. But um, what's so interesting and here is the name of the wrench here of the it says four in one rim wrench number 5104. These things command big money and more than you would expect. Now, the problem is, when I got this wrench, I said, man, it's 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 just not the one. I, it, it looked just like it. Let's clean this up. Take a look at it, what it looks like cleaned up. And we're calling this project done. Oh, my God. Did this come out fantastic? This is as close to new old stock as you're going to find one of these. First of all, these are always in horrible condition because a lot of times they were left in garages, thrown in back of trucks, things like that. So they were never really taken care of like an indoor, like a woodworking tool or something. Let me show you what we got here. You can see here now the writing is cleaned up. See what this says, four in one wrench, 5104. You can see here the Black Hawk. All the writing came out beautiful, patent 1923. But on the handles here, I was telling you, is the patent date of 1920. And uh, same thing back here. Uh, it's funny how the patent dates are all, all over this thing. You know, sometimes you never see any. But you can see here, it's got this, uh, this is almost like a pressed tin handle on here. Same with here. And uh, how this works, this is so cool, isn't it? How this works is you can see here, this pulls out, this swivels to whatever size you need, you know, so when you get the size you want, you uh, there's a little shaft in here engages in a hole in these sockets, pushes in, and that's it. Then you grab it like this, and you use it like a speed wrench. Now, when you say, well, how do you know that's close to, you know, what it looked like new old stock? Because I found this. Now that is the one that's close to the one that my dad had. I think I'm almost sure this is the one he had. Now, this is this one is the one I paid a lot of money for because it's like a new old stock condition. And uh, you'll never, I'm telling you, wait till you, when you look at these and try and find these, these things are always rusted, pitted, banged up. Look at this. Look how beautiful this one is. And this one obviously is, is a little bit differently made. You can see here it's Bog Manufacturing Company out of Chicago. Um, it, this probably dates back to the, you know, later than that one. The patent date on that one's a 20. This one here is probably a little bit later, although I don't see a uh, patent date. But you do see here um, it, how this works. It's a little bit different. How this works is you have to pull down on here. There's a spring. You pull down here and it pivots. That pin will lock it in, you see, to whatever size you want and it stays there. The handles aren't pressed steel, they're knurled steel. This was probably a bear to make. I don't even know how they made it to get this handle on here and then forge all this. Um, much smoother action here again with the cap then. I didn't do anything to this. It's still very sharp. That's why you can tell it's a new old stock condition, but look at that. Aren't they beautiful? And uh, look look at how they, like I said, these things are crazy expensive too. That's, that's what's unusual. They're expensive when they're in horrible shape. $40, $50 in bad shape. So let me show you how these work. Now this particular nut tester isn't really made for free spinning, but 
he will try the new old stock one, place it onto the nut like here, holding it here, and look at this. Is that just not a thing of beauty? Look how smooth that is. And I mean, the torque you could generate, ah, oh, just beautiful. Let's try the, uh, the Black Hawk, okay? Same, uh, same nut. Look at that. This is when men were men, you know? And now everybody looks for electric and battery corded stuff. I mean, this is when guys would just grab a tool and, ah, isn't that beautiful? It's just lovely, isn't so it? So in closing, I don't know about you, but I'm uh, happy as a clam right now. Those, those, uh, those two speed wrenches, they're unbelievable, aren't they? Oh God, you know, and you gotta feel them. They're nice, they're really nice. Especially then, I paid over a hundred dollars for that NOS one. I know, I know, a lot of money. It's like Ben Curfee money. But you know what? You gotta do what you gotta do. You only go around once. And sometimes, you know, I don't do drugs, I don't drink alcohol. I spend money on tools. All right, uh, thanks very much for tuning in. I know it's a long one, but it was a pretty good one. Uh, hope you have a great day. Take care now, bye-bye.